Hey gang, welcome back to another week of Ranching Reboot. This episode is sponsored by our generous patrons over on patreon.com forward slash Red Hills Rancher. So today we've got somebody that's been on quite a few podcasts and he's pretty famous for some of the things that he talks about, which is remineralizing cattle with salt and a red solo cup cow. So today from TaylorMade Cattle Company, we've got Steve Campbell going to join us. But we're going to take a little bit different track to a lot of the podcasts you've probably heard Steve on. Um, we're probably going to talk about cows and, and remineralization, but that's going to be at the end of the show. The reason I wanted you here today, Steve, is I have listened to, I'm not going to say every podcast that you've done on every other platforms, but a lot of them. Uh, you know, Red Solo Cup Cow, we've, I've heard that several times. The two great ones you've done on Working Cows, uh, I'll pop my head, 161 and 196. Those are both just chock full, fantastic information. But I don't really want to like rehash all that today because that's all out there. I want to know about Steve. So Steve, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about TaylorMade Cattle and how you got your start? Oh, um well, I got the, the name uh, when I was trying to put together enough information for the first full day long school I was doing. I had had a different name for my consulting before that, but um, it didn't really bring any bells for me. Uh, Taylor made what, you know, what is your zip code? What's your elevation? How much rain do you get? What's the temperature, latitude, all of that takes a different kind of a cow for all of these different um, environments and management styles. So uh, that's how I come up with the Taylor spelled with an I, T-A-I-L-O-R. But uh, I was born back in the 50s and uh, always around cattle. We got in the trucking business when I was six or so because the ranch wasn't big enough to support two families, uh, dad and uncle Daryl. So, um, common I story out of the late fifties, I'm told, pardon me, common story from the late fifties. I'm told, <laughs> well, anyway, so I grew up around cows, but it was the smelly end, uh, washing out, scooping out, driving cattle trucks, working on cattle trucks. And, um, I guess my, my experiences from that, one, learning something about a cow and stockmanship and whatnot, uh, how to be a help rather than uh, slow things down around the corral or the load and shoot, was uh, preventive maintenance on trucks. I didn't, I didn't want the trucks to break down. So I wasted a little money, uh, according to a lot of people, on the amount of service and preventing maintenance I did. Well, dad died uh, and I moved back up to a ranch that he had bought in the mid seventies. I moved it back up to it in 88 there in the mountains where I was born. And um, I took that preventive maintenance, well, preventive health uh, back to uh, raising stalkers on grass and how do you get them to not get pneumonia when they first get there or pink eye and foot rot. And, um, and if that happened, one, how to get over it, but how to not have that happen next year. <clears throat> Same sort of thing with weeds and then promoting the growth of dung beetles and spiders and worms and <laughs> birds. Maybe I, maybe I beat that up enough. <clears throat> I'll keep going. I like it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, I, uh, I got a degree in economics and I had a final from an older German professor and and it was really hard to uh to get an a but it was extremely hard to get 100 and a friend of mine after the first final i took says uh, dr growl wants to see you you got 100 he thinks you cheated and i actually answered something a little better than average and he gave me extra points i have no clue what i got right but i certainly learned what i got wrong uh kind of back to why did that cow get sick the marginal efficiency of capital. So if I spend a dollar, do I get ten dollars back, three seventy-five, a buck and a quarter, or ninety-five cents? Well, I I took that to heart for the trucks and for the cows. Maybe I'm spending 
$10 more on something. Long, let's just say on the mineral side, but the, the actually on the, the mineral deal that I like is, you know, these are all natural products that God gave us. And uh, just if you can entice the right amount, it actually is less money than virtually every mixed mineral out there. Um, anyway, how do I uh, get the cattle to, to consume a few more minerals so I don't have to doctor pink eye or foot rot or scours or what do you do to not have to pull calves? Go ahead. Can we pause there for a second? Okay, so you're saying that by feeding minerals, we can clean up pink eye and foot rot. I'm saying by feeding clean minerals um, was about 15 years ago. I found a little book in a, in a secondhand store called uh, Fateful Harvest by Duff Wilson. And uh, as it turned out, the mayor of Quincy, Washington also went to the same college I did. And uh, long story short, well, now I know this person, I need to read this book, but the the uh, the co-op in Quincy, Washington. Hey, that's that's pointing a big finger at somebody. They were putting toxic chemical, uh, not chemical, minerals into the minerals mix for the the fertilizer, and crops died or wouldn't grow. Cattle, horses died or got sick. And uh, this Duff Wilson, kind of an investigative journalist, he wrote that book. And from that point on, on the mineral side of things, I nothing from China. And I've been, when, when I did that, and I, I went away from any mixed mineral and just was using Redmond salt and uh, a little later the Redmond conditioner, my health problems just kind of melted away by using these God-given underground clean sources. So was that an overnight change or did that kind of take a couple of years? Uh well, it wasn't just overnight. It takes 120 days to change out all the red blood cells in the cow or you, Brian. So okay. the minimum amount of time to reach the first or the next rung on the ladder of health would be that 120 days. But from one year to the next, the number of copper bumps, which is the cow over your left shoulder, if uh, she doesn't have it, but right right behind the hook bones in front of the tail, if the cows have a little bump there, that was either a lack of copper in the diet or something in the environment tying up that okay. copper. And so they, they got this pronounced bump there. Within one year, those virtually went away. So it wasn't overnight, but it did not take years to happen. By the next year, the quality of the calves was better. These indicators of, of mineral deficiencies. Um, the uh, phenotype of the animals uh, was better uh, coming out of the cow. Did, did you hear what I just said? The phenotype of the animal was better coming out of the cow. I was finally expressing the genetics that I owned because I got the epi, the air, the water, the grass, the mineral stockmanship, the epigenetics were a whole lot closer to what that cow needed. Okay. Okay. So observations with Redmond and salt and Redmond conditioner, you said, clean up your cow herd. What, what time frame was this? Uh, you gave me another thought there, but uh, that was uh, about 20 years ago. Okay. About 20 years ago. Yeah. Give or take a year. Uh, that's when I started down that path. I had broken my right ankle uh, really bad in a horse uh, deal. And uh, this uh, chiropractor, certified applied kinesiologist, he really was an expert in nutrition. And he said, quit eating that inflammatory food, sugar, flour, well, rice, potatoes, you know, concentrated carbohydrates. He eat these omega-3s and the high water content vegetables and and my pain went away well um the um looking at what was going on with the hooves on my horses and winter feed versus summer feed and smooth and rough and 
um, you know, things were starting to click there, uh, Weston A. Price, Maynard Murray, uh, reading all of those books about that same time. Um, Maynard Murray had used a sea deposit, sea salt deposit out of the uh, Gulf of Mexico, C-90. Yep. And, um, and that is still available today. I think their fourth person, it was Maynard Murray, Don Jansen. Oh, man, I'm going to do somebody injustice here. Um, it's okay. I get all the hate mail anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I get all the hate mail for when something gets wrong. But yeah. Okay. I, but anyway, it, it, that was the one that uh, the idea got me started. But I live so much closer to Redmond and uh, that uh, it was it was readily available about 100 miles from where I live. Okay. And where do you live? I don't think I know. Well, I was born in the mountains of Idaho, so mm, 40% up uh, the left side, the west side of Idaho. And uh, then we moved down into the Boise Valley, the Treasure Valley, and uh, kind of grew up down there. And in uh, early 30s, I moved back to the mountains, and I lived up there for 24 and a half years. And now I live on the very western edge of uh, the uh the treasure valley if you will i'm i'm oh, about four miles from the snake river about where the squiggly line starts on the western the southern end of that squiggly line i'm over by there i'll have to check the map and see what that part of the world looks like i'll have to admit i've never been to idaho i think i've only flown over it like maybe once or twice looked at it on a map a couple times but uh well, there is a uh, there's a kind of a banana across the uh, bottom of uh well, a little ways up from the bottom of the state of Idaho, and that's the Snake River Plain. And it starts out about 5,000 feet elevation over on the uh, west side, and it gets down to eh, 2,000, maybe a little bit lower. Well, by the time it gets to Lewiston, quite a bit lower uh, on, the, uh, on the west side. But uh, there's mountains south of that in Idaho and mountains north. We're, we're blessed with water. Uh, but if you didn't irrigate in the Snake River Plain, it would be sagebrush. So someone said if you could take a steamroller and flatten out all the mountains in Idaho, it would be, be as big as Texas. I could believe that. And that, that kind of leads me to start wanting to chase a rabbit about water in the West. But maybe that maybe that's for another entire podcast. But so you're you're reliant on irrigation to grow your forage? What, where I live now, it's all sprinklers. And if I did not have uh, <clears throat> irrigation water, it's about 11 inches. So I would need, oh golly, 15, 20 times the number of acres that I have to do what I do. Up in the mountains, it was all, uh, and our, our irrigation season is something like 170 days. Up in the mountains, uh, it was all uh, wild flooding, as someone called it. But, uh, you know, you're out there with a shovel and uh, keeping it spread out. And that irrigation season was about 110 days. Um, but there were years where it frosted every year up there in the mountains, too. So it was interesting. Okay. That, uh, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking lately about how water is used in the mountains and, and in the West, you know, for how so much of it is diverted for irrigation. And then, you know, we, we stop it down a river, like on the Colorado river, Lake Powell, Lake Mead for, you know, because people have to have drinking water. And I wonder how sustainable of a practice that is going forward. You know, we're experiencing record drought in lots of the country. Uh, you know, I, I didn't look for Idaho, but I know I saw it yesterday that there's the uh, Colorado and New Mexico snowpack is in, in a lot of places, 20, 30, 40% of what it should be. And there was only one, one region where it was actually above normal. Um, are you guys looking at maybe some short irrigation this year? Shorter irrigation, but we're nowhere near that short. But <clears throat> one of the things you mentioned there, uh, I'd like to address, and that was, uh, my uncle had lived there in New Meadows his whole life, and, and his comment was, you need to control your irrigation. And when I first moved up there, I was having a heck of a time trying to get the water spread out, and I was looking for extra ditch right to get water down there, and it was taking me 
15 or 16 days to make a go round and to come back. And uh, within about five years, once you understand the water and I'd pick it up and use it three different times before it ever, I ever got through with it. Well, now I'm, I'm getting through in about 12 days time and shutting the water off every once in a while. So someone who doesn't know anything about water will waste a lot of water. And to someone that water is dear to will um, use it wisely. Yes, and my uncle, I remember one time in August, I had him come by, I was trying to figure out what I, what I had le left in front of me. And we kind of looked at everything and he said, well, I think you're right. I don't think you've got enough water or excuse me, enough grass to make it to the end of the grazing season. I just had too many cattle that year, but he said, I have never seen grass of this quality <laughs> this time of year in my life in New Meadows. And he was 60 something at that point. So, um, yeah, people that have a vested interest in using the water to the best of their ability will not waste water. I, I would agree with that, but in the back of my head, there's also the California almond farmer that's farming in the desert central Valley. That's trying to irrigate walnut and almond trees in the middle of a Valley saying that it's a responsible use of water. Um, that's probably a whole different conversation. Though. Yeah, it, you know, how would I, how would I best? Oh, golly. Um, now I'm, I'm lacking for names here. Uh, Don Huber from uh, Purdue had, has been poking a big finger at Roundup for a long time. And he was in a chat group on an email deal and, uh, um, Another fellow on the group said, is there something missing in the soil that's keeping us from getting these more uniform rains like we used to get? You know, now we it just is dry, 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 and then we get this big deluge and a lot of it runs off. And Dr. Huber just immediately said, yeah, there were these four organisms and he listed them all out and said, the wind would pick those up, take them up into the atmosphere, coalesce clouds, and you would get a rain. We have killed those off with chemicals. And so we don't get that more uniform rain throughout the year like we used to. But there are just more people now than there used to be. So the, the need for water for human beings has gone up. And I guess thinking about maybe where your mind is going, the book Collapse by Jared Diamond. It's a big, a big thick book. He wrote a number of uh, big books, but we... Uh, we tend to put people in cities and, and we have to go farther and farther and farther away to produce the food to feed them. And then we get a bad year where there's no moisture and half the people die and Machu Picchu, they never went back. You know, it's like, well, that's, we'll just leave that as a monument to our stupidity for what we did. Um, I think that scenario got repeated several times in ancient history, not just Machu Picchu, uh, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Romans, all their civilizations had major, major problems when their quote, advanced farming techniques failed. A, a very good book with a third as many words that gets the point across at least as well is uh, dirt. The Erosion of Civilization by David Montgomery. And that was his first of a trilogy of books about the subject. The second one was The Hidden Half of Nature, talking about the biology in the soil. And then the third was Growing a Revolution, where he talked to people like Gabe Brown and Ray Archuleta and Christine Jones and, and others. Uh, okay, anyway, I got those titles. I need that name again because I missed it. Um, David Montgomery. And that's a that's a pretty good list of books to read. On, I'm going to have like two full pages of show notes for all these books you're giving me. <laughs> it's fine. Well, I was motivated to learn some stuff because when I changed my diet, the pain in my ankle went away. And it's it's like, well, how does this work? Well, how does this work in the soil? How does this work in our cows? Uh, kind of an inquiring mind. Uh, 
all through the years. Because it's all connected. Like Absolutely. We are the soil. We're made from the soil. And that is our ultimate destination when you know the soul, the spark of life and consciousness leaves our body. We will become soil again to feed another generation of living creatures. I agree. And I think like the extension from that, that I've really kind of gotten into in the last couple of weeks, you know, just the other day, there was a a paper that came out saying that the USDA tested, I think it was like 600 or 700 animals, beef animals. And they found antibiotic residue in quite a few of them that were specifically marketed as antibiotic free through a plant that said, we only kill animals that don't have antibiotics. And I even, I even remember going on to read that about 25% of those animals that they popped for antibiotics were part of the GAP program, which uh, that's the program that Whole Foods uses to certify their beef has been, you know, all naturally treated and, you know, hasn't had GMOs or antibiotics or growth hormones. They're finding growth hormones in those animals that are, that are labeled for that with the producer affidavit saying we never gave this animal antibiotics. I wonder how, I wonder how that's going to reflect on the rest of the beef industry at large. And you know, I I don't know how you feel about it, but it's my understanding that there's a very large percentage of animals that, when they hit the feedlot, are classified as high risk and get antibiotics right off the truck. Like specific percentages, I'm sure that nobody really wants to let that be known, but I know what happens. Right. And I think any feedlot manager will admit that it happens, but doesn't want to talk about the difference between high risk, low risk, and no risk. And he doesn't want to talk about how many of those high risk cattle there really are. Those are a couple of conversations I'd like to have maybe on down the line. If you want to have that conversation with me, go ahead and write in. We'll try to set that up. But so back to the point we are soil, our cows are soil, and it's a it's a closed loop it's basically a closed loop that we need to start thinking about production in and what can the soil provide for my animals if my soil and my land can't provide everything i need for my animals do i have the right animals for my land you know th- that's another good question um wow i I wish I had a piece of paper so I could write down my little high point here. But Weston A. Price, a dentist back in the early 1900s in Cincinnati, he was seeing so much facial deformity in cavities. He thought it must be something in the environment or, or uh, in, in our food and went around the world, found these 15 groups of people eating in the old way, nothing modern Western process. It was how they grew and prepared their food. A lot of the preparation was fermentation heat, moisture, slight acidity, a little bacteria, and time. Virtually anything fermented is better for you. One of the reasons for that is it's got probiotics in it. But anyway, um, these uh, these groups, there was no rhyme or reason the amount of fat, protein, carbohydrate. M- minimum fat, 30. Uh, Eskimos, 80% fat. The common denominator in uh, 1930s. Hang on one second. Okay. was that the average American was getting five to 10 times the vitamins and minerals. I'm holding up sea salt, but you could have the Himalayan salt. You could have the red, that was the Redmond real salt. Anyway, there are a number of those sea salts. Um, you remember earlier I said, that when those calves were born, the year after I switched and nothing from China, why nothing from China? Virtually every mineral coming out of China has cadmium in it. The first thing cadmium does is screws up a cow's ability to regulate internal body temperature. The way you would know that you had cadmium in your herd, if they have a slow hump in their back from uh, the hook bones up to the shoulder blades, Right, that, that a hump ridge that where the back looks like it's ridged up a little bit ridge. above where it carries the ribs. Yeah, so some people call it a ridge back, uh, you know, and you could have a cow with hardware that could look that way as well. But if you've got three out of a hundred that are showing this all the time, 
they're your miner's canary saying, hey, I've got a dirty mineral. And uh, it was well pointed out in that book, uh, what was going on there uh, uh, by Duff Wilson, the fateful harvest. Anyway, <clears throat> wow, this is a rabbit hole. Um, Pottinger's no, chase it. No, no, Pottinger's cats. He, uh, back in the 40s and 50s there, I can't remember whether it's LA or San Fran, he had the cats in two locations and he was doing adrenalectomies and then they were trying to get the, the adrenal tablets for human beings, just all of them to be the same. Well, he found that the cats that were in the facility where it was cooked meat and cooked milk, within four generations, they couldn't reproduce. Some of those cats didn't even make it through the surgery. The ones that were on raw meat and milk they stayed perfectly healthy for each generation of that cooked diet, which think about how much more processed our food is today. It took three generations of the raw diet for those cats to get their health back. Well, now I have, oh, three or four of my clients that are there. They've got third generation calves on the ground now from cows that have a clean mineral rich inner uterine environment and uh, one particular gentleman in northwest south dakota he had 42 of those second you know the, the cow got cleaned up and she had a heifers and steers and well bulls but they steered them anyway 42 of those heifers he kept for replacements and then they're clean and mineral rich and they get pregnant and they have a calf so he said, if you took all my 270 cows and you picked out the 50 best cows out of everybody, in, including those first calf heifers, 35 of that 50 would be out of my first calf heifers because he was finally expressing the genes that he already owned. So it's, I don't know how I even got there, rabbit hole. <laughs> Looking for those party girls that can conceive at 14 months. Uh, well, he was, yeah, uh, party girls, I guess I think about earlier, but I mean, you know, he was breeding at 15 months to have a calf at two. So he's every 365 and, uh, every, glandularly hair coats, uh, butter fat, the, the, the phenotype, everything coming out of those cows, they were just better animals. He, at the point of conception. You know, he's feeding his bulls the same way as the as the cows. At the point of conception, he he put together as close as he could the best genetics that he could. If the if the bull was only fed to here, that's as good as he's gonna be. You know, and you can't go beyond that. Well, by getting that clean mineral rich 120 days before the bull and cow get together, everybody listening, if you've got cows, you have better genetics than you're seeing because. Night, unless you're Gabe Brown or someone like him, <laughs> you do not have good enough uh, gen or, uh, epigenetics, soil, bricks in the grass, 12, 14, 18 bricks grass, B-R-I-X, the level of minerals in sure. the grass or in a tomato or in a carrot. Right. Oh, uh Bricks is sugar. That's what I've always understood as sugar. It's a measure of, you know, how much sugar and carbon that those that that plant is storing up in the leaves or in different parts. Um, I, I have trouble finding grasses over about six, no matter how I graze or, or what I do. But I haven't I haven't tried foliar C90 yet, which is probably what you're going to tell me I ought to try. No, no. You finally got me out of my rabbit hole here. So what I was about to say <laughs> is. Uh, Weston A. Price in World War I in the draft, the, the people, the men out of the Southeast, white men have been there the longest and had farmed that land the longest. Seven out of 10 were not good enough physical specimens to go into the army. Upper Midwest, we hadn't been there near as long. We settled the coast first. Seven out of 10 of those men were good enough physical specimens. Well, a hundred years ago, we were eating real close to home, not like we are today. So there was a there was a big difference. And then the number of scientists per hundred thousand of population, less than three hundred in the south and southeast, 
per 100,000, over 600 in the upper Midwest. So having the minerals in the, in the food turns us into Arnold Schwarzenegger and Albert Einstein. And then there's another book called, sorry, I'm getting off on a different deal here, but um, uh, Food and Behavior by Barbara Reed Stitt. And she was a parole officer. And normally in the early 90s, four out of five parolees were back in prison within five years. Of her parolees, she could get to change what they ate. Four out of five were still productive members of society. When I was a kid, people would say about Jim, well, I wonder what side of bed he got out of this morning. But the better question might have been, I wonder what he ate for breakfast. You know, did he eat sugar yeah. or did he eat protein or fat? Yeah. Big old anyway. bowl of Captain Crunch. Well, and, and the other thing is we've introduced 50 million unique substances in the last 75 years, and not all of them are good for us. So we've been on the land. We have the dust bowl. We tried to put it back to grass after we mined a bunch of minerals out of it the more the more you mob your cattle up the more often you move them the quicker we'll get the minerals back in the soil and you can talk elaine ingham or the johnson sioux bioreactor all that sort of thing but the other challenge we have now that they didn't have 75 years ago is all of these toxins that man has put in the environment so our cows actually need more minerals now to function than they had available back then because We've put a whole bunch of straws on the camel's back, a whole bunch of toxic straws. Yep, yep. So the you're talking about toxicity in cadmium, and you said minerals from China are contaminated with cadmium. Now, I know you're not saying that because you're a racist and you hate China. I know that. I know you're saying that because you're warning people that these products from China are not good for your cows. So I, and this, and you probably, I don't think anybody probably would know. Okay. So when we have, when you buy a mineral block from the co-op, not that you do that. And I quit doing that last year after, after listening to a couple of your podcasts. So you buy that co-op mineral block or that, that bag from your local feed supplier, and it lists off everything it's got in it, copper, magnesium, vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin D, all this other crap. Okay. Where do those vitamins come from? <laughs> where do those minerals come from well to compete on price typically cadmium i guess when you were going through all that what came to me was caveat emptor yes. let the buyer beware um and you asked me how far i wanted to go let the buyer beware on everything including whether or not you want your a needle in your arm over the course of the last year but to get that, that requires a level of transparency that's difficult to achieve. I mean, and I'm talking about transparency well, okay. in the supply chain. So back to what you were saying, here's this gap certified and they tested them and here is all of this. There is a lot of cheating, okay? Yes. They're willing to sign their name to get a dollar. We do that way too much these days people don't stand up their principles know your farmer know your rancher if if i come to you brian and i look you in the eye and you're you're telling me unwaveringly with your eyes that no i did not use any antibiotics i'm more likely to believe you than this slick trade magazine that they get paid big dollars to spin uh, whatever it is they're trying to sell. When was the last time you watched the movie Wag the Dog? Uh, I, I haven't, but I just listened to an episode of Joe Rogan uh, that had the guy on it that directed that movie, that wrote and directed that movie. Mm -hmm. It was, it was mm -hmm. really interesting. I'm, and I'm familiar with the, with the 100% familiar with the concept uh, okay. of the tail wagging the dog. Yes. Is that what's happening right now in with our cattle mineral we're getting told the tail is telling us this is safe this is safe this is what you need to feed what, and what they're telling us is look at the look at the mineral the label on this package and look at the label on our package it's the exact same minerals and ours is ten dollars a, a bag cheaper well you get what you pay for uh in a lot of cases 
Uh, I can't say every case. You used to be able to say that, but maybe you can't anymore. Anyway, there are places where you can get clean minerals mixed, but not very many. And that's that's why, I mean, the the sea salt here, there's uh, what? Redmond, the Kansas, the... Um, C90. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a different place on the C90. The Himalayan, these are the underground sources of sea salt. The ancient so, sequestered sources that you like yeah, to talk about. Okay. Yeah. So anything that's been blowing in the air, there was a, <sighs> air pollution. It, it, we get enough air pollution and it inhibits our ability to control our behaviors. We get the guy going up on the 23rd floor of the uh, motel there in uh, um, Las Vegas with the machine gun. Yeah, kind of yeah. funny how we never heard anything else in the news about that, but go on. Well, I, I mean, I mean, it's like, sorry, Lee Harvey Oswald, I'm just a patsy. What, what was going on that they didn't want us to know about? And they hired this guy to go do this thing and said, yeah, we'll be real. I don't know. I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting off track here. Um, I, uh, it's you get just on whatever really, track you want to get on, Steve. Yeah, <laughs> it's just really hard to find good, honest people. I am, I am absolutely blessed. I am absolutely blessed. I 95% of my clients around the country are good Christian cattle people. And I say it in that order. Um, I, I don't get around very many that aren't, that aren't good ones for whatever reason, maybe there's the law of attraction or, or whatever, but I know who made me and I, I thank him every day. And yeah, life, interestingly enough, that uh, podcast 196 with Clay, I went to bed one night and you know, say my prayers uh, always out loud. And then I said, God, what do you want me to do? How do I help? And uh, you can edit this out if you want. And I'm thinking Fauci and Pfizer. And I woke up the next morning and it's like, you got to call Clay Connery. We haven't had a spring and it's already summer. Cows couldn't recover from last winter's feed. We're going to have way more pink eye, foot rot, scours, that sort of thing, because there's very little nutrition. And that was literally God was like, Steve, you, you need to do this. That, that's your job today. So that's how 196 uh, became a reality. Well, I, it was one of those that I think I listened to it probably three, four, maybe even five times, because just to make sure that I under that I was understanding what you were saying. Hey, Brian, right, right here, because um, I didn't say it well enough in the uh, talk. We've got our we've got our tea bag, okay? okay? That, we're, that we're making the mineral water in. Any more? Uh, I was telling everybody every different way to make it. Any more? If you have a stock tank, some people don't. We got to do something else. Yep. It's not metal well if you've got a metal one we're not doing this it's on a float you know every other day monday wednesday friday we're putting this tea bag in but when you go to take that tea bag out you kind of get the weight of it and when you feel like you've got the weight you just jerk it up out of there and throw it out because you don't want to leave a cloud in that water up for the fresh day because that's an imbalance of minerals. I had people telling me, well, I would swirl the bag around in there before I'd take it out or I'd, I'd, I'd run the water right on top of it. No, you want it as far away from the water coming in. And Because anything, the solids, the solids that are still in the bottom of your tea bag that didn't dissolve just, just by water kind of circulating by, that's the ugly stuff. That's the stuff you want to go put on your ranch roads or around something yeah. you never want to grow. The, the extra sodium chloride and any imbalance. <clears throat> but I just wanted to show that deal, which you can't see, it's only my face, but you, boy, when you get ready to take it out of there, get it out of there in a hurry. And you're trying to leave the smallest cloud behind in that water, because that means you left the least amount of imbalance in that water. Okay. 
Do you have a All specific right. kind of bag that you like? I mean, I, I think I heard you say burlap sack um, last two year. Quarts. Two quarts. A burlap bag is two quarts, two pours. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I'll, I'll try to hold it up here, but it's that woven nylon okay. feed sack stuff. Um, I don't have anything else right here. Uh, if you, there are some uh, dog food bags that look kind of like that, but they're really shiny. Okay. And you grab one of those and you stick a water hose in it. And, and if the water doesn't just start running out, it's the wrong kind of woven bag. You need kind of that nylon, plastic, whatever it is, uh, woven bag. Uh, uh, barren you want it to hold a little bit, but also to have a good leak rate, but not just to run out. A, uh, let me put it this way. A burlap sack is too coarse and a 600 count pillowcase is too fine. A pant leg would work. Okay, pant legs for mineral water. You, got it. Yeah, it's getting to be summer. You want shorts. Now we've got two tea bags for mineral. <laughs> you might want to wear shorts, sir, but I do not. My legs get to see the sun for about 30 seconds and they are toast. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, yeah, I do not. The typical rancher, tanned everywhere, tanned in the face, tanned arms. Yeah. Lily white legs. Well, I don't even remember how we got to where we are, but maybe you've got some other thing in mind. Here. Um, well, we were talking about fermentation and that some of the best things to eat for people are fermentation. So, Humans are hind gut fermenters. So that all takes place in our small and lower intestine. So it stands to reason if we're eating foods like sauerkraut that have been pre-fermented, that's going to be easier for our system to digest. But cattle are different because they're foregut fermenters. All that fermentation takes place in, in the room and with all the microbes. So does fermentation of feedstocks, for lack of a better term, that should have a different effect on the cow than it has on us, shouldn't it? Uh, Brian, are you asking me about us eating, um, what would you want to call it? I mean, I'm thinking cellulosic fiber, but uh, fiber. I, I was just thinking sauerkraut, because that's, that's what comes to mind when I think of fermented. Well, uh, you know, you think about a gorilla, or a chimpanzee, they have a bigger gut than we do because they eat more cellulosic fiber than we do. Okay. Um, there is a book uh, called, uh, I think it might be Carnivore Diet. It's uh, Paul Salad Eno. I mean, he's like, the only thing you want to eat is meat, and his last name is Salad Ino. Yep, Paul, Paul Saladino. Salad yeah. Anyway, it is crazy in there where he goes back and shows where once we got into more animal protein, how quickly our brains grew in size. And um, it's, it's a pretty good book, but he's maybe a little bit too adamant about what he knows. Um, I guess if I was going to, uh, you know, Hey, he would win every argument that he and I or discussion that he and I ever had. Absolutely. I do not know a tenth of what that man knows. But it 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 almost sounds a little. It's like, well, I don't know. I think I'll just leave it right there. I think that the carnivore diet can work for a lot of people. I think that there's a lot of benefits. I, I can see some benefits to it, and I can also see some places where that might be a train wreck. Um, I haven't I haven't gone completely over to the carnivore side. I'm not completely on the keto side, but just like with your experience, I cut out the refined grains, the white bread, the sugar. My joints don't hurt anymore. It's kind of amazing how that happens, and it does. It just took you know getting that crap out of my life for four or five days. And it makes a big change. Um, this 
kind of relates, but it but it doesn't. There was a uh, a study Joe Robinson found eatwild.com. She's got a website, but this was 20 years ago, 18, 19, 20 years ago. And they had 610 people who had had a heart attack. Okay. So they put half the men in each group, half the women, half the tall, half the short, half the heavy, half the skinny. You know, they tried to make the groups as even as they could. And they put one group on the American Heart Association diet. And then they put the other group on mostly that diet, but they took away some omega-6s and added omega-3s and then more high water content vegetables. Okay. And it was supposed to last for five years, 60 months. But they had to quit at 37 months because it was unethical to continue. Too many people on the American Heart Association diet were dying and they couldn't force them to eat the diet that the American Heart Association says you should eat to after a heart attack or if you want to prevent one. It didn't work. I wonder why. Um, <laughs> so, um, Dr. Robert Lustig, the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, did a talk, uh, Sugar, the Bitter Truth. This was seven, eight years ago. The first one was, a, there's a lot of biology kind of going over your head, but it was super interesting, and I was telling everybody about it. And uh, about three weeks in, I went back to watch it again for the fourth time. I mean, you know, whatever. And here's this placard. And it says, the Board of Regents of the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, has determined that it is no longer in our best interest to have this video on our website. Well, whoever was giving him 10 or 20 million bucks said, you get that guy off of there or your money is going away. But I mean, he called a spade a spade. Sugar. Sugar is what gives us heart disease, not the, the fat. So you've got HDL, the good stuff, LDL, the bad stuff. Well, there's two types, large buoyant from fat. I had to listen to that talk three times to learn this word. It can't, the fat can't get in behind the endothelial cells in our arteries and start narrowing them up. It's like a bunch of balloons going through. But sugar, it can get the large, large dense, it can get in. And that is what gives us that artery problem. Well, if you get the blood work and your triglyceride, your LDL is high, but your triglyceride number is low, that's from fat. The LDL is from fat. If your triglyceride number is high, you're, you've got problems coming. I, I can't remember who it was explain it to me whether whether it was on this show or on another one but like when you eat when you eat fat your body can take that and convert that into kind of slow energy but when your body eats sugar and simple carbs that it can't burn immediately it tries to store those as fat um so like eating fat doesn't make you fat eating sugar and refined grains and processed food that your body doesn't know what to do with that either there needs to metabolize very rapidly or store immediately. And, you know, you eat, you eat a big spoonful of sugar, you're going to get a sugar rush. That's the initial hit. But that's only from just a tiny fraction of the sugar you ate. Your body's saying, and your liver's going, hey, I got to store this. So it does a process that, I forgot the name of maybe glycogenesis or something, but it takes those sugars and those simple carbs and stuff those into a fat muscle or, or stuff those into a fat cell or stuff those around a muscle just to get rid of them and, and keep them hanging out. Well, that is basically the story that this Dr. Robert Lustig told, and you can find him on the internet, you know, on YouTube, 45 minute long talk, you'll, you'll get, uh, what he's L U S T I G is uh, how to spell the name. Um, very interesting talk. Uh, I don't know what uh, I'm a fan of the Weston a price foundation.org org. Um, there's some very good information there. 
the very first article I ever read on that website was The Oiling of America by Mary Ennig, who is dead now. The best article that I ever read, you can find it online, is Yudkin versus Keys. John Yudkin versus Ansel Keys. That explains <clears throat> why you want to be eating more fat and less concentrated carbohydrates better than anything else I've ever, I've ever read. Okay. Another, another thing in the longest ever probably show notes. <laughs> <laughs> so how is what we feed our cow? I guess, let me rephrase that as we're raising cattle and raising livestock you know, it takes 120 days for the red blood cells to completely change out. So when we take these animals, and I say we as we as the livestock industry, as the cow calf industry, not what you or I do specifically, but as we producers, we take our animals and and plug them into the commodity system wherever we do, whether we're selling them as a background or whether we're selling as fats, ultimate destination for that animal, probably 95% of the time is going to be at a big feed lot for 90 to 120 days. And then after that, you know, it's a short ride on the Jesus bus to freezer camp at, you know, Cargill JBS national or whatever the other one is. I can't remember what, if we're the way we feed in a feed lot with a lot of high energy grains, a lot of corn, a lot of starches, a lot of sugars, and those animals don't get exercise. And we don't have to get into the like the hormone modification business in the ionophores. Like, how much of an effect does what that animal eats and what it's taking in affect human health? Um, well, omega threes come from the green leafy parts of plants. Okay. Omega six comes from the grain. Uh, they, they say um, that the, a perfect diet would be one-to-one. -one. Uh, the average American is um, a good American would be four-to-one, but I mean, we're anywhere from that on the good side up to probably to 20-to-one. And... Um, 120 to 50 days on grain, literally you have removed all of the omega-3s that had come from grass. Now, are the, does that mean there are no omega-3s? No, that's not true. Um, but kind of back to the, to the CAFO model, if you will, um, more and more people are trying to direct market and they're taking the better animals and, and that shape of that animal. I was looking around a minute ago to see if I had a red solo cup sitting here. <clears throat> um, the shape of that animal is going to affect how well they digest. And so lucky for someone that knows Brian and is, is buying meat from Brian, Brian's picking the best animals and the worst ones are going to the feedlot system where Fred Provenza wrote a book called Nourishment, excellent book. And, and in there, if mom had grain, junior's gonna have to have grain to perform up to its potential. If mom had grain during utero, in utero, if mom only had forage, junior's gonna perform great on forage, better yet on alfalfa and even better yet on grain. Well, um, <laughs> whole methane thing and whatnot. Uh, in the in the feedlot, eighty percent of all of the baking soda mined or manufactured in the U.S. is fed to beef and dairy feedlots to buffer the acid rumen. Hold up, did you say eighty percent of the baking soda used in the United States is fed in feedlots? beef and dairy feedlots to buffer the acid rumen. You know, they get, they get too acid and you get acidosis. You can get yeah. to al an alkalosis, but, but I mean, that might be 2% of the time or something. Uh, can we, 
can we like chase a chase an acid base in the room and rabbit trail and and talk about what what that means like what what does it mean when rumens to acidic what's happening in in that fermentation tank well let's start at alkaline you're gabe brown you've got 20 bricks grass life is good the cattle are getting all the minerals they need they're alkaline their resistance to disease internal external parasites is very high the lower we get on ph our resistance to disease internal external parasites flies lice pink eye foot rot scours we get more and more well out on grass if it's low let's just say it was six bricks grass but there wasn't a lot of corn and soy around we're going to have less when and we're moving the cattle more often we've been doing this for five years we're going to have less problem than someone else who's got two bricks grass across from corn and soy and you're getting all of the toxins rolling in when fly season starts you're going to get pink eye at the beginning of the season and there are other people living in the same area and they maybe get a little bit right at the very end of the pink eye season and i'm just thinking about pink eye and and it shows up because low mineral and the cattle are under stress, whether that's stress from chemicals or the heat or, or, or. Um, anyway, a fellow came up to me, oh man, 11 years ago, something like that. And he was complaining that 60 to 70% of his registered calves had gotten pink eye that summer. This is like November. So we talked about Weston A. Price, Maynard Murray, Carrie Reams went through all of this. And I said, that sea salt in the, in the salt shaker or in the mineral box is about 20% bioavailable. The rest is going out the back of the cow and she's now our fertilizer cart. So next year's grass is better than this year's grass. Okay, well, attached to a carbon atom, those minerals are 90% bioavailable. Kelp, our grass that has a mineral. You make the mineral water. We were talking the tea bag a little bit ago. It's 50% or more um, bioavailable. Anyway, <clears throat> kind of, I am not the first person that ever thought about mineral water. I mean, Soleil, it's a French term and it's a mineral water deal. But we were making this in five gallon buckets and backing it out to the cows. And it was a learning curve and it made your back sore. Anyway, I called this gentleman at the end of August the next year. Uh, we both started doing this mineral water that fall and through the winter. And, you know, pretty quick, we're getting better at making volumes. Um, came up with the tea bag idea. A friend of mine from uh, New Hampshire came up with the tea bag idea. Anyway, um, I called him at the end of August and said, well, how was the pink eye this year? And he said, not one case. And the only thing he did is he gave liquid minerals in nature's balance to his cattle in nowhere near as much as they would consume. I went to Texas, I think it would be four years ago in March, and uh, I'd never been invited to uh, herd the cattle that were in more trouble. And we made mineral water starting the second day. And he called me up in oh, a week or 10 days and he said, man, the, the, these cattle are drinking at least 75, if not 80, 85% mineral water. And they were coming down off the hill and the first tank was this new one. And then they had to go another 20 yards to the old freshwater tank. And I said, well, just take your tea bag and stick it in the other tank. He called me up the next morning. He said, well, that took 20 minutes or 30 minutes to figure out. Now they stand in line down at the other tank <laughs> to get the minerals that were missing. He was spending over $1,000 a month on 118 cows for one of these uh, 16 different mineral deals. And I've... when I walked on the ranch, he had a mineral problem, a toxin problem, and an energy problem. And he was spending over $1,000 on a brand name multi-mineral mix cafe style cafe mineral. style absolutely and yeah. after 45 days he just quit putting that out because they just quit eating that 
all they wanted, sea salt, mineral water, conditioner. That was about the first six months. So I, I have a very, very similar experience with mineral water. Okay. So after Working Cows 196 came out last year, listened to it two or three times because I was, I was on a little bit of a road trip the day it came out. So listened to it on the way up and on the way back and had some discussions. The next day I found a pallet of C90 within an hour drive. I went and I got it. The day after that, I was hauling out equipment. I have a, uh, I have a portable water pump. It's solar powered on a trailer. So it's a submersible pump. I can take that thing and I can throw it into a stock tank. I can throw it in a creek. I can throw it in a pond. And then I've got 2,500 feet of black plastic pipe I can hook to that and move anywhere. And I've got two 250-gallon portable tanks. So I brought over a joint of pipe, brought the pump, set it up to where it was, you know, going to draft out of the stock tank that the cows were on. So we're going to take water from the tank that the cows have access to. We pumped it about 200 feet downhill into that, into the portable pond. And that's where I put the mineral water. The first day, I think I put 50 pounds of salt in my burlap bag. I came back and checked it in two hours and it was gone. So I put a hundred pounds in it and I came back in four hours and checked it and it was gone. Wasn't anybody standing around want, wanting water. Gave him a day off, let him have fresh water in both tanks. Second day, I came back out. First of the morning, I threw 150 pounds of salt in the bag and I left. Came back six hours later and it was just, just the crumbs in the bottom. And I didn't do it right. I mean, I switched it around, got all the, Got all the cloudy shit in there and, you know, and then I threw the bag out, but I hadn't heard that little bit before that you're just supposed to yank it out and throw it away. Um, but toward the end of the second day, I started seeing about half of them walk past the mineral water and go that 200 feet up the hill to drink the fresh water. So, I, okay, they're probably done. So I just went back to feeding salt. I'd put out a tub of, of straight C90 and that's the product I was using. I was using C90 and you can, you know, we can talk about why, why Redmond's or Kansas independent might be a better product. That's, that's fine. It's what I could get and get quick. Yep. It is probably more expensive than Redmond's or Kansas independent. We can say that. Um, so two treatments of the C90 re mineral water within the next seven days, I, we were headed for a pink eye rack and we probably had, 20 calves that had pink eye and one eye. And the policy this year was to not treat until we had two bad eyes. So after we treated the second calf for two bad eyes, one of the customers, one of mine, that's when we tried the mineral water. I had several cows that were limping, bad feet, mine and the customer's cows. I had one cow that was down that had just had a calf. She was down to maybe 450 pounds, skin and bones, barely traveling, look like hell. Like there, she was a chronic problem. Within two weeks, pink aisle disappeared. The cadmium humps disappeared. All the feet got better. And that chronic, I couldn't, I can't pick her out of the herd after two weeks. She picked up that much condition in two weeks and got traveling better that I couldn't find her out. I couldn't pick her out of the herd other than my tag number. Um, you just don't know who's going to go there. I mean, I have other stories, but that's a, Brian, that's a, that's a good story. Um, we also had, uh, some blocks that we got from the co-op that my client brought, got from the co-op and one of them. It was a brown block of salt with iodine. And the other one was a salt and trace mineral block. They quit eating them. And so I would put out C90 a couple times before we did the mineral water. And you want know, to haul out 200 pounds a day to 220 head of cattle. Oh, that's a lot of salt for the first couple of days. Well, I realized they were just trying to get balanced. After I did the mineral water trick, Salt consumption was low the rest of the year, like super, super low the rest of the year. Well, each ounce through the mineral water um, is the equivalent of two and a half ounces dry. The bioavailability. Right. So, yeah, it just, 
the marginal efficiency of capital. Yes, time is money to make the mineral water, but you're getting two and a half times out of your your dollar investment at least. And after the first week on this, every other day, one tank with a float, not metal, you, you kind of have that figured out. There was a fellow. No, not gonna, not gonna go there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't. You know, the experiment on your own. Okay. <laughs> so uh, back to pink eye. Comment I had about pink eye. You know, pink eye's been in the world ever since I can remember. I can remember I was a I was a little fella, and Dad had a old hired hand out here on the ranch. His name was Ivan, and Ivan was up in his sixties by this time. And uh, there, I remember one year Dad was having a wreck with some with some customer steers. And they're having a lot of problems with pink eye. So Ivan went to town and he bought a jar of Morton iodized salt. And he put that in his saddlebag. And when they found one with pink eye, rope it, tie it down. And Ivan would take that salt and he'd go up and he'd just pour it in the bad eye. And then kind of close it up and let him sit there for a minute with that salt in her eye and then let him up. His theory was, They'll either cure it or to make it so bad they don't care. And I I seem to remember it working often. And that planted in my mind that pink eye is related to iodine deficiency. What do you think about that? Um, well, and and that learning curve there in New Meadows, uh, you know, from one year to the next, okay, we need more iodine. We need more copper. We need more selenium. I'm trying to do my own thing. And then it's like, okay, I got to find those sources, but not from China. And that's when things just really got good. Uh, but the the mixed uh, commercial uh, salts slash mineral, they, I just never could get out of having problems um, with those. But uh, what would I say? Iodine. <laughs> It's not just one thing. They all interact. You've seen the wheel with all the arrows going back and yeah, they all interact. The thing about making the mineral water, I mean, you could use $10,000 a ton Himalayan salt or, or in Kansas, $2 a bag for the fine without the treat. The clear portion of that water is 92 minerals in nature's balance cleaner than the water that the Vikings were throwing their trash overboard into. Uh, People that are on city or they call it rural water that has chlorine fluorine added, they'll go after the mineral water a little more than the fresh water to avoid the chlorine and the fluorine. That extra chlorine and fluorine, it settles to the bottom of the if you're doing two tanks to the bottom of the uh, the tank with the with the mineral water in it, so the all you're going to get, and that's all explained very well in the Sea uh, Energy Agriculture by Maynard Murray. Right after World War II, the American Navy went around the world, multiple samples of every body of water. It was always 92 minerals, and they were always exactly in a certain balance. There were more minerals in a gallon of water at the equator, warm water, than there were at Sitka, Alaska, cold water. So think about that in summer versus winter. Uh, But it was always 92 minerals, a volcanic vent, a tsunami wave action a month later, we're back to 92 minerals. There was an imbalance on the ocean floor. Well, if we put the sea salt in here and leave it set for a while, the imbalance is on our new ocean floor. That's why you want to have a little bit of unused sea salt that you're throwing away each time to ensure that you had enough of every mineral you needed to make perfect ocean water. And just to be clear, that stuff that's remaining in the bottom of the bag, that that does not belong on pasture. No, I, you know, I guess you could... Uh, you could try putting along the fence row uh, so that your electric fence didn't short out, but this would be a little bit like the Romans in Carthage. You know, Matthew, what is it, 513, once the salt has lost its taste, well, we took the taste, quote unquote, the 92 minerals out of here, and what's left is, well, that's 
were the Romans on in Carthage with where what's they left of the fields with yeah. whatever was left out of the bottom of the salt barrel. Makes sense. I makes sense because over the last year, you know, I've heard that, you know, well, they salted the fields. Well, the guy I bought my C90 from is spraying it through his irrigation system. And he reported he reported pretty good results from that. And that really got me thinking like salting the fields. Well, C90 says you can even use it like that. Redmond says you can use it like that as a full year spray on cereal crops or on grain crops. Okay. But that doesn't square with, you know, salting the fields until you brought up and until you gave me that little nugget that was, what did you say when the salt is used? Uh, I think it's Matthew 5, 13. Once the salt has lost its taste. Okay. Well, the, the taste is those minerals in there. People talk about how much more flavorful the, these sea salts, whether it's the C90 or the Redmond or the, the uh, Himalayan. Um, yeah, there, there are a number of stories about that. I don't know. I've had people put it through pivots. I've had people go out and, and spray it dry. Uh, I mean, spray it on. Maynard Murray, in his book, he, uh, 2,200 pounds the acre. He'd do 550 spring, fall, spring, fall, 2,200. And don't call me for five or 10 years. Well, the classic study in there or test, I guess, is they, they had tomatoes that they planted in a number of different uh, planters and they went up 200 pounds of sea salt at a time and then they came along and they sprayed the tomatoes with the virus now where have I heard virus before? anyway they sprayed a <laughs> virus on these tomatoes that always kills tomatoes and all of the controls died but a few of the 200 pound lived and a few more of the four and six and eight when they got above 1,500 pounds of sea salt to the acre, remember Weston Price, all of those groups of people were the, that were super healthy, they were eating five to 10 times the vitamins and minerals the average American was getting in the 1930s, and we don't get half of that today. Anyway, when they got above 1,500 pounds, none of the tomatoes died. Another gentleman, he weaned 750 calves, so 550-ish pounds, steers, heifers, average. Puts them in his feedlot, feeds them fairly bland prairie hay and a little bit of corn silage. And then, you know, he started up in the corn silage and 10 ounces of sea salt per calf per day. Eight days in, he gets a two-inch freezing rain. I'm telling a vet friend at a big feedlot, and he goes, I hear the wreck coming. I called the gentleman the 17th of January. I called him a month after he'd weaned those calves, and he had still not had one sick calf. Well, he was feeding five, six, seven times as much mineral as those calves would normally ingest. He was just mixing it in. Well, that was pretty valuable manure. They drank a lot of water, but nothing got sick. I mean, this if we wanted to do this ourselves, this is a quart, let's say. You put two teaspoons of sea salt in there. You don't you can shake it up or whatever, but three or four hours later, there'll be a sediment on the bottom. So we grab another container and we very carefully pour from the one with that has the sediment into the other one and when we see this, the clouds start to get here, we throw this away, drink a pint of that mineral water per adult per day. That, that's the fastest way to get the minerals back in you. I'm glad you mentioned like uh, mineral water for people because hey, I've noticed. I, I just made some this morning. I'll, I'll show it to you. Okay. While he's going to get that, uh, a year, year and a half ago, we got a reverse osmosis water filter installed here at the house. And those RO filters are great. I like the taste of RO water, but it literally takes everything out. And since we've done that, I've noticed that every couple of weeks, I'll just get to the point where, you know, my brain's a little bit foggy. Things aren't quite making sense and I'm not feeling the greatest in the world. And I can't seem to drink enough water. Well, what I'll do is I'll get a glass and I'll, you know, I'll 
I'll crush some sea salt into it. We use uh, Himalayan pink. Good. I'll put some sea salt in about four inches of water and just swirl that around and then choke that back. And within two hours, I feel much, much better. I don't know if you can see, but there's a, uh, sorry about how, yeah, how yeah, I can see it. the camera is, there's a cloud. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to pour this from one into another here. I don't know if you can see. Oh yeah, I see the clouds still standing way down at the bottom. Yeah, but when I start to get nervous about the cloud heading towards the lip, I'll just stop and, I, well, here, let me- Didn't even let it get close. That. No, let me, you can see how cloudy now the bottom, the bottom of that is. Yeah. But the, the clear stuff, I usually just get up and have six or eight swallows in the morning and do it again at noon. And I've got my pint in for the day and life is good. So, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I think like a lot of people think that sports drinks like Gatorade and Powerade do the same oh, thing, but it seems like none of that crap in Gatorade is going to be bioavailable. Brian, we're all going to run into this. You need to mix up some milk replacer for a calf. Okay. Or electrolyte for a calf. This is your own electrolyte. But if you're, if you're, you've got a calf that's sick and you're trying to, I would use at least half mineral water and one tablespoon of coconut oil. Oh my gosh. That calf will get up way quicker. Then okay. if you don't use the mineral water and that it's just like adding a quarter of a stick of butter to that calf of the, the coconut oil. And the coconut oil is just there for the fat for the. Ah, for the yeah. Fat? Okay. Now, if you want to know what a hot flash for a woman feels like, you take a, a, a tablespoon of uh, coconut oil and within 30 minutes, you'll have a good idea of what a hot flash feels like. In the winter time, you're cold. That'll that'll warm you up because your body's getting that big, massive influx of energy that it can either store or start synthesizing for use. Way better than that Hershey's candy bar, the 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 coconut oil. Yeah, I mean, you, now we can go get something done. Yeah. Oh, that Hershey's bar tastes so good, though. It makes me feel so good while I'm eating it, <laughs> and so bad after I eat it. Well, are you trading me? Are you telling me I have to trade short term comfort for long term benefit, Steve? Uh, we can leave it there, or we can say this quarter's profits versus profits 10 years down the road. I mean, how much easier it is it to put on a pound than to get it back off? <laughs> oh, I, I can run a lot of pounds off in a day by being a jackass and just running around the pasture. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. No, you, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Okay. We've been going for a while. You ready to like give us some more thoughts on Red Solo Cup Cows? So it'll be about 1st of May when this comes out. Um, I don't know what else you could really say about Red Solo Cup Cows that I have questions about. No, I think th that was a good question. So this come out the 1st of May. Get out there in your herd. The cows that are shedding the earliest, better glandular function. They're more adapted to your environment. That is the one thing you can't buy is a cow that is adapted to your environment. The cows or heifers that have not shed off by the time you put the bull in, to get them bred, they, one way or another, they're gonna get a check mark. They have the lowest glandular function well glandular function and hormones uh they they go together um the taller an animal is in any breed the fewer sex hormones they're producing so shorter animals are producing more sex hormones because they shut off long bone growth and estrogen shuts it off if this is the cow's head in the front end of the cow purse so she should look like she's walking downhill on level ground and a bull, the testosterone shuts it off in the back first. 
walking uphill. Rarely do you see a bull walking uphill before two years of age, though. But the flatter they are on top, no, no downward rake is a good thing. And I, I guess in the spring of the year, that a lot of that other stuff, it's in those talks. But this time of year, right now, the cows that shed early, that I would write all those down. Uh, they, they are keepers, everything else being equal. Everything that's calved in the first 21 days, so the first cycle after we turn bulls out, yep. I've got all them written down, and we're going to be watching them over the next uh, you know, 30, 40 days. Every time I go out and I notice one of them starting to slick off, you know, that's going in the book. So, Brian, you, you heard that talk, the, the 196 on the mineral deal last uh, June? June. I think it was June, mid-June, maybe. Okay, see, so you had, I don't know, when do you calve? I started a month ago, and I've got about another 60 okay. days. Don't judge me harshly. We're going to shorten that to probably 65 days, and we're going to go in the 1st of July, which is going to give us calves about now, next Okay, year. so uh, where my mind was going is you didn't get your 120 days before the bull and cow got together. However... Just about the time the cow got pregnant is when you got the clean, mineral-rich going. Yeah. I would venture to guess that this year's calf crop is going to look better than last year's calf crop. I'm going to guess that the length of the navel cord this year is probably a little longer and maybe slightly larger in diameter. But yes. next year's calf crop is going to be better than this year's calf crop. And that's the leap of faith that... Uh, you know, most people, they'll, they'll change the mineral to not have the pink eye and whatnot. But the real benefit is what shows up a year later in the next year's calf crop. Their resistance to disease, but the, the phenotypic quality of the animal coming out of the cow is, is better than in the past. Now, I, I remember hearing you say something about pulling the C90 out of the pasture between 60 and 90 days before when you start calving. So I erase that. That no. was, we we've no. learned different and, knowledge. No, it, 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 that was not that. Think about the, the, the sodium bentonite clay, the Redmond conditioner or any of those others. They're a member of the zeolite family. And, uh, or maybe it was the Redmond's product specifically. Yeah. That about. Well, not, not the salt. It was the conditioner. And in the, the general statement is if, if whatever is uh, going on, the conditioner is an optimizer. If things are going good, they're going to go better. If you feed the conditioner raises pH, promotes the growth of the biology in the gut, binds the neighbor's toxins. You spend a dollar on conditioner, you get three things back. You spend a dollar on the natural soda out of Rifle Colorado to raise pH. You got one thing back. It was a Band-Aid. We didn't fix the problem. We can keep putting the Band-Aid on. The conditioner is going to fix the problem. Well, when your first calf heifers get ready to calve, do you pour the alfalfa to them? Mine? No, <laughs> I, I treat oh, mine exactly you like the calf. <laughs> I, well, I treat you, mine exactly like the cows yeah. I wish they were. They, my campers okay. aren't special. Okay. Uh, you don't do that for a reason, which is large calves. Similarly, if, if your calves or cows are in very good shape, you could get large calves. Now, if you've got skinny cows at calving, you could probably feed it. That's up to you. I'm just, some people that have overly conditioned cows have gotten in trouble because conditioner promotes growth and we don't need it right there at the end on the inside and i think there's a lot to be said that you can feed condition and fertility into damn near anything but can you afford to do that that's that's the deal and that's why the glandular function the butter fat and then that Everything getting bigger. She's getting taller. She goes back because she's she's more fertile than the one that's flat. And the last cow you want is the one that walks uphill on level ground. 
she's got a bigger belly than the herd average and a, and a wider butt than the herd average. So yeah, that's that what give you the red solo cup. Okay. Um, so I guess, I guess I had that mistaken about, you know, the conditioner, cause I took the salt away, like I said, back in January. So I should probably go put that back in. Um, absolutely. And, uh, actually you can detox with enough sea salt. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I would absolutely put the salt back in. Uh, I, absolutely and the, the mineral water you know whenever it's not freezing where you have to worry about hoses or something and but if it's one tank um this uh where i was just at up in montana they had these uh concrete tanks they were filling them with a two inch pipe in the middle and they had about 400 cows in there and the tank was a little small and so i was having them i said to start let's put 50 pounds uh two different tea bags one in opposite corners and come back tomorrow and see what you've got in there uh to see if but i said it may take more than 100 pounds altogether for those cows for one day so they'll as soon as they start irrigating they'll they'll uh, they'll get that going okay so i wanted to circle back you know we talk about hair coat which is relates to glandular function and hormonal balance earlier you made a comment about the horns and i'd like to go back to that because the way i understand it and like i said i'm a i'm a fairly uneducated redneck i've never been to college like never taken any animal animal biology but it's my understanding that the horns on a cow are basically made of the same thing that hair is it's keratin and it's it's a structure that's encased in bone so logically Horns are related to hair coat if they're made of the same stuff. And you were saying, uh, you were saying that you could get some indicators and some information by looking at horns. You want to go back over that? Sure. So Jan Bonsma from uh, South Africa, he was here in the '60s and early '70s, and he wrote a book, "A Man Must Measure." I think the better book is um, Bonsma Lectures for the person first starting out. But in there, he has a, and I've got a copy of that book outside, but uh, on the uh, red solo cup cow, towards the end, there's a picture of two skeletons. And it's the back end. Uh, I'd always been told uh, sex hormones shut off long bone growth. Sex hormones shut off long bone growth, you know, 50 times. You get to looking at those two pelvises and um, um, hang on a second here. Um, you get to looking at those two pelvises and one of them has a much thicker tail. And one of them, the one on the right has a much smaller in diameter tail. Well, when I was a kid, I heard a broom tail cow. That's what I heard. Okay. And I'm thinking the part on the ground, maybe the fellow said a broom handle tail cow the smaller in diameter if the if the hide looked the same on the top and one tail was an inch and a half in diameter and the other one was two and a half inches in diameter the only place for it to go is down into the pelvic opening well sex hormone shut off all bone growth so you've got 20 five-year-old cows out there that just look like carbon copies of each other if one of them's got really small in diameter, shorter horns that, that aren't flaky, she's more fertile than the one with the largest in diameter and the longest length horn. I mean, everything else being equal, we left the rest of the cow the same. Well, rarely does that happen, but it's just an indicator. S finer bones, shorter in length for the age of the cow is more fertile than large bones and, and long. Now, long horns, golly, there's some people there in uh, Texas, they're tickled with how, uh, what do we do here? <laughs> they are tickled with uh, how their uh, calves are coming out white instead of yellow coats, but the horns are now growing 
longer faster in the longhorn which is a big deal to longhorn owners not so much to these people they're trying to get an animal that is uh, uh phenotypically correct yeah i think those longhorn guys they're just they're trying to sell inches of horn <laughs> which that's and they okay also, but but he was he was going for the phenotype and good function and as a side note he got uh and I have about 20 minutes. This is the max I've got here. I got to go load a truck. Um, he, uh, as a, he, he's doing everything else right. And the horns are growing longer too. Okay. I was, I was in the panhandle of Texas here last fall in November. And I saw a, uh, a Coriani bull that was walking up hills. Like, stop, we got to get a picture of this. I mean, you normally don't think Coriannis is being very masculine, beefy. Five miles later, here is a longhorn bull that's walking uphill even more than the Coriani bull. I have a hard time finding English breed bulls that walk uphill. So they were doing what, what the book says, glands, hormones, is supposed to do. I have a theory about that. Okay. Because the Corientes and the Longhorns aren't traditionally part of the production commodity system. So, you know, the people that own them don't treat them like the people that own the black, black and red Angus cows that feed condition and fertility onto them all the time. One of the reasons I, I, I'm a fan of the Coriente breed is the, the vast minority of Coriente producers are feeding them past what they could probably stand. Most people just, oh, well, they're just crap cows. We'll just put them out in the pasture and rope them. I mean, and that's not even getting into, you know, the epigenetic history of natural adaptation that the breed has. How much of that's transferred over over the last hundred years? Not real sure, but there's some diamonds in the rough somewhere. I mean, everybody's cow herd, I, I think everybody's cow herd has a lot of animals in it that can survive on next to nothing. But it's it's finding those that you're having to feed to make the fertility and condition because you're not you don't have to feed all of your animals to maintain fertility and condition. There's only a percentage of them that you're feeding to maintain that. The rest of them can probably do it on on a low input program. A fellow uh, in western Oklahoma had bought a number of Coriani cows and uh, he was just kind of trading cows and. Oh, I was I was quite tickled with the percentage that were just shiny hair coat compared to the rest. I'm like, you better give those shiny hair coated ones. Uh, I I wouldn't let them out of your hands for a while. That there's your potential for for a future herd. I mean, you're going to get rid of these and save this 15, 20 percent, and then next year you're going to buy some others. I don't know, you know, what you're going to do, but. I wouldn't just sell those really shiny hair coated ones. They're saying I, I can get along in this environment with a little bit of nothing way better than all the rest. Just what you said. And those are the ones that, well, none of mine are probably ever going to go to the barn again, but those are the ones you'd want to sell to people that you like in the area. Be like, exactly. She came open. I think she's a great cow. I'll give you a good deal on her. Just, you know, she can get by on damn near nothing. Yeah. You know, we and we talked her we you mentioned earlier about how to get good cows and i kind of had a rebuttal of that i think there's a few ways you can get good cows okay you can make your own or you can go by the ranch that they're standing on i would i would agree with that uh, i was with a fellow on the arizona strip and there's a hereford cow with pretty horns and a monster steer at her side and and uh, we were we were riding and Anyway, um, I told him, I told the owner, I said, uh, man, that cow is screaming. I love the Arizona Strip louder than anybody else. Where'd she come from? He said, well, she came with that last ranch we bought. So she was born there. I mean, and uh, that is well explained in Fred Provenza's book, Nourishment. Yep. Yep. Well, this year coming into 22, breeding season 22, I have calves that were born on the ranch, but they all came either as a pair or as late third trimester and were born on the ranch. It's not going to be until next year 
that I get a breed ranch raise two year olds. So there's, there is a crop, you know, my one year old crop that's coming up. That'll be 14 to 15 months when I turn out breed, when I turn out bulls to breed and I am going to turn out a, a one and a half year old, uh, half Mashona bull to okay. breed the, to breed those one year olds and to cover the two year olds. Um, and I, I, I've only got like 56 running age cows and I don't know if that needs one bull or two, <laughs> probably two. So, so, uh, Gerald Wyatt from, uh, Australia, classic livestock management services, CLMS. Um, he said in his last newsletter, if you can see a bull's epididymis on the bottom in the middle of the testicles there, you know, no V or anything, they're both like they're supposed to be, like Drayson said in his book, Herd Bull Fertility, you have pretty good assurance that that bull can breed 50 to 60 females in the first 21 days. And, you know, I hear that a lot. I mean, I, I've heard it, and I'm not going to dispute that at all. But how okay. do we know? But is there a way, other than DNA and genetic testing, to find out of how many bulls that cat, or how many cows that bull is really going to service? Um, two or three different stories, but mom and dad got married in 50, and dad said, Joanne, whatever you do, when you go to Brian's, don't ask him how many cows he's got. That's like how much money you got in the bank. Count his cows, multiply times 50, you'll be real close. Went to... Uh, uh, Did you mean count bulls and multiply by 50? Count bulls and multiply times 50, you'll be real close. What did I say? Count his cows, I meant bulls. Yeah, you said cows. Uh, okay, I meant bulls. So you can see how far it slipped in uh, 70 years. Anyway, um, went to uh, Bastrop, Texas and picked out six... Uh, Aka Ushi, so red Japanese cattle, moved them to the mountains of Idaho, put them out with some black Angus cows, um, and uh, 11 months, you know, nine months later, they're born, and then uh, 10 and a half, 11 months, their DNA and the, those animals, and they found one of those bulls bred 107, another one 73, and another one 59 after moving them from, you know, Austin, Texas, clear to the mountains of Idaho. Um, Frankie Thorne had a bull papa who at six and a quarter years of age, his shoulders were eight and a half inches wider than the length of his rump. He put him out with, um, I mean, you know, this is all his genetics now for a while. He put him out with 100 heifers, 14, 15 months of age. I mean, this is a huge bull. Yeah. In a 4,600 acre field. Okay. And 60 days later, 92 of them were pregnant, but it was a long walk home. <laughs> okay, so it's possible, but the more fertile the heifers are, sorry, this is public, but the more wantonness there is in the heifers. In a situation like that, their hormones are going to have to say, hey, where is he? I, I'm, it's my time. <laughs> They're going to um, be chasing so, him around. Well, yeah, there's going to be some of that to be able to get this. So it, it's both sides, but it's both sides, not from the way most people describe it. It's both sides because you did the right thing, selecting males and females to go back in the herd and, and you got them mineralized. Um, purebred animals, purebred corn takes more minerals than hybrid corn or black baldy cows, the, the crossbred cow. Or Corriente crossed with whatever else looks good. Yeah. There. Well, there we go. Well, and one of the reasons they work is because the minerals in that ground behind you are not as good as before white man showed up. I, I would agree with that. I mean, even though, let's just say, over 90% of the ranch has never been tilled, has never been farm, soil never disturbed. I don't think it, yeah. One of the, it's, it's a pretty nice little pocket of undisturbed native range. And mm -hmm. I call it old growth grassland. 
I love that. Okay, so we can have native range. Yeah, we can have native range. You can take a farm field and put native grasses and native forbs back on it and call that native range. That's great. I have a bunch of old growth grassland that has never been disturbed by a plow. Much better off. Much better off. Yeah. The, the, the people with what you have get by on average quite a bit better than those who have tried to put it back to grass after someone mined the minerals out of it. Then it takes a while to get the minerals back. Probably ought to finish up here in five minutes because I thought I got to label something down there too. So, well, let's, uh, well, then let's just go ahead and head on out of here. Steve, you have given us a ton of resources and I know you got to go to, uh, to ship some product out here in just a few minutes. So before you go, um, what if, can you run through where you're going to be like your May, June schedule, some appearances you might be making and ways people can contact you or how you would like to be contacted to, uh, to get more information? Well, my website is tailormadecattle.com and Taylor is spelled with an I, T-A-I-L-O-R. Um, this month here, I am headed down to uh, Sunday morning early. I'm headed out through Colorado and uh, I'll, I'll be in uh, Oklahoma and then down into Texas, there is a two-day school at, uh, oh man, Garrett Kuhn's place in uh, um, Fredericksburg, Texas, so southwest of Austin. And that's, is that in April or May? No, it's April and it's the 25th and 6th of April. It's on my website. So if you go to my website and look at schedule, it kind of says what I'm going to be. So I'm going to be making this trip and it, that one's kind of filled up uh, as far as when I got to be where, but the next trip right after that is the uh, grass fed exchange is at uh, Fort Worth the 17th through the 21st of May. So I'm going to leave around the 10th or 11th of May and needing to go back down there and then got to work my way back to Idaho. So um in June, um, where, oh, I'm, or excuse me, in July, I leave about the first and I'm kind of headed, uh, let's call it a clockwise loop into Wyoming, up into South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, back to uh, the very southwest corner of Wisconsin and then dropping down into Iowa and Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska and, and making my way home. And then in September, about the middle of that month, I'm headed basically to a three-day deal in Louisiana, the very last weekend of, of September. And then the first weekend of October uh, in the northeast corner of Arkansas. And the next weekend of uh, October, I guess I should get those dates here, uh, 14th and 15th, I'll be in South east ohio and then the basically the 20th through the 23rd of october is the weston a price conference in knoxville kentucky and then i've got to drive home from there i drive all these places so i drive all these places i just i don't fly anymore because they make you wear a mask not anymore. Well, I'm not flying anymore for a long time. <laughs> I they don't blame made you. made that bed and I'm not sleeping in it. Sorry. I, uh, back at the beginning of March, I got on a plane for the first time probably since 20, yeah, since 2019. First time since COVID happened. And it was the beginning of March. And, and they were jerks about masks other than in the Bismarck airport, which is, which is pretty chill. I don't know if you've ever been to Bismarck airport, but. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not that big or busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they, they really didn't care at Bismarck, uh, Denver. They're, they're pretty much jerks about it, but you, I was seeing signs. And like I said, this is the beginning of March and they're saying, you know, the mask mandate expires March 18th. Like, 
okay, well, that's when COVID's over. Like COVID was going to end when the, when that federal mandate for him to wear a mask on an airplane. And we haven't heard anything about it for weeks. So, you know, I, I guess I just didn't hear them in the spring of uh, 20, right? I, I thought they said we needed two weeks to flatten the curve, but it must have been two years to flatten the curve. Is that, I, I sorry, I'm getting political. <laughs> I, I must have heard it. I must have heard it the same exact way because I swear they said two weeks, two weeks, weeks two weeks, two weeks. But yeah. uh, typical speed of government. Um, if you want to come back some other time, talk politics, I'd love to have you back, Steve. I know you got to go and I want to be respectful yeah. of your time, sir. Thank you so much. I enjoyed uh, meeting you and uh, this was fun. Yep. I sure enjoyed having you. And uh, with that, I'll let you go. And gang, y'all have a great week. Bye-bye now. God bless.